Welcome to the Margie and Lisa Show. I'm Margie Wigan. I'm Lisa Jackson, and we're hoping you can call in today. We have some very interesting subjects that we're going to be talking about. Our first segment is about Dr. Martin Luther King and kind of what he would think of the world today and 55 years later since his I Had a Dream speech. Um. Yeah, so 55 years ago, uh, 1963 was the I Have a Dream uh, that my four children will one day be looked at or thought about as the uh, with the content of their character, not the color of their skin. Yeah. So how are we doing with that? Um, in recent times, it seems to be not so great. Right. It's it's the the country seems to be. I thought we were in a different place with our country, and now um, with the politics right now, it seems like that we're, we're backtracking a little bit and looking at more of people's race or what country they're from instead of what they do as a citizen or as, you know, what their merits are as a human being. And I, I find that just a little disheartening because that's something I've taught my daughter since she was very little, never to judge anybody by, you know, their nationality, their religion, um, their race, um, any of those things, but really judge people by their character and their actions. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and I do the same thing. Yeah. Most people, I think, do. Yeah. Um, so Martin Luther King had four kids, mm -hmm. speaking of the four children. His, um, his oldest, uh, in 1968 <laughs> when he was killed, so 50 years ago, yeah. um, oldest son, MLK III, was 10, youngest was six, yeah. Bernice. Yeah. Um, Dexter and Yolanda were in the middle there, I think seven and eight years old. Yolanda actually has passed away in 2007, and Coretta Scott King, the widow, passed away in 2006. Yeah. So the, the kids are still in the picture. Yes. Um, I know when, they, when the Martin Luther King Day was again made a national day of service as it was in 1994 and right. still had been declared a national right. day of service. It was redeclared a national day of service. That was interesting. Um, yeah. Yep. And, and Trump, um, Trump had the King children, at least Bernice, right. there. So it's just Bernice and her two brothers, Dexter and MLK the third now. Yep. Um, so it's nice that they're still part of the picture right. and, you know, can remind us of the dream. Right. It's um, always inspiring to me whenever, I mean, right. his words have so much value. I mean, like, really, despite his color or anything like that or his religious preference, or I just find it so inspiring, the, the information he brings forward and, you know, the statements that are, you know, that you see that he's made, they're very profound, and they have a lot of meaning to him and a lot of depth, and it's really about love and, and, and really having a common ground for all citizens in the United States because that's what our Constitution was founded on. Exactly. So. One of the really cool things <laughs> that happened recently, um, on uh, Sunday, the Masjidin Islamic Center in town Saw had its that. third annual Martin Luther King Day interfaith celebration. Yes. And the amazing person who spoke. Did you go? Yeah. Yes. Awesome. Is Imam um, Talib Mahdi okay. from Dorchester. Yeah. He was very wise and wonderful. And he mentioned something that I found very interesting. Um, we know that Martin Luther King Jr. was a minister. Yes. So clearly a Christian. Yes. But what he referred to or, or called to mind was that Martin Luther King actually studied Gandhi. Right, and his yeah, nonviolent protest methods, yeah. and Gandhi was a Muslim. Yes, so it all gets tied together, and mm -hmm. in fact, um, the three people of the book are Christians, Jewish, and Muslim. Yes, because they're all from the Abrahamic tradition, coming from Abraham. Yep. So he, so this wonderful ceremony or celebration, tied all, all these the different. Um, strands together right. to talk about we are really one people. Um, right. And the beliefs are very similar with all three religions. I mean, really, the foundation of that is good, good family, you know, good servitude to your community, good citizenship. Exactly. Um, and, and really honesty and equality and, you know, the, right. the things that, you know, all of us try to teach our children and, and what we want to see in the world. I mean, I, you know, I think it's something that really makes our world stronger instead of degrades it. I mean, you really want to bring people up 
and maybe you don't see eye to eye and there's plenty of people you don't see eye to eye with but it doesn't take them you know like you want to you want to take what their beliefs are and enhance the good part of their beliefs right and we'll look for the common elements right so um mm -hmm. one th another thing was that um in the teachings of muhammad the muslim prophet he encouraged no racism, mm -hmm. social justice, and dignity, yes. which is exactly what MLK, Martin Luther King Jr. Yes. did. Um, the Quran also says, quote, those who are silent while others are oppressed are as guilty as the oppressors. I agree. So it's complicit. It's, you know, it's like the, the bystander does right. nothing. The right. upstander, and this right. is what our kids are taught in our schools now, yes. in the health and wellness curriculum, stand up to bullying. Right. Which is what oppression is. Well, I mean, the Nazis are a perfect example in Germany. I mean, look at how many people were fearful or whatever. But if you have the masses and you bring them together, you can affect change. So that's why in the United States, and another thing that I gathered from my reading on um, Dr. Martha Luther King is really the right to protest and, yes. and to bring forth your opinion so yes. other people understand. And it, it brings light to what, instead of looking the other way, and I work a little bit about you know the trends right now that are going on there seems to be a lot of apathy you know what I mean and they I mean there's strong mm -hmm. opinions on the left and right but there's a lot of people in the middle there that really are apathetic they don't want to talk about it they don't want to deal with the issues and unfortunately this is ongoing and I think as a race you know as a country this is something we need to <clears throat> we need to look at and continue to improve the quality of our life and the people yeah. that live here. And I'm not sure they're empathetic. Mm -hmm. I think it could also be shock. Right. Not, or not, not, not what know to, what to do. What to say right? or and, how to. And, and if you the leaders are, are acting in a way that's unfamiliar yes. in a leader, what can we do? Right. You know, so that, I think that's part of Feeling it. Feeling waiting helpless. to see yeah. right, helplessness. Yes. You know, helplessness can make you freeze like right. a deer. In, Absolutely. In Absolutely. Um, the other quote that Imam Mahdi shared was that followers were prohibited from injustice to themselves and others. Yes. So not allowing yourself to be oppressed. Right. And so this is, you know, MLK was acting on his Christian beliefs and human morals to act against oppression, right. but it ties right in with right. the same things that are, are talked about in the Quran and, right. and the Bible and everything else. And the Jewish religion as exactly, well. Exactly, which yeah. is this, it's just the Old Testament yeah. as well. Um, so he took a stand against something he saw wasn't right, even though it meant risking his life. Right. And um, actually... Twice. Yeah, well, he was stabbed when he... I was reading that. I couldn't believe... Awful. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't believe that... That I did not know that, and I guess if he would have sneezed, he would have lost his life. Yeah, when I read that, I I didn't remember that and what I'd learned about you know. And his he was so gracious about it and what he said publicly afterwards, you know. And I think I think part of that's his faith, right? But he also had that. He did. He had that. He had a greater vision, right? As in. He's here not for himself. Right. He's here for others. And right. how can he help others, which is just amazing to me. Well, and it was interesting. I read about his background. So, you know, it's in the media right now, there's a lot of derogatory terms on people's background and thing. But he came from a, a very broken family. And he, he started to strive for better. He was given opportunity, and he took advantage of it mm -hmm. and made a better life for himself and obviously made a, made a better life for many, 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 many people and made well, our country better as far as I'm concerned. And I think, I think many, <clears throat> many of our heroes in society come from that background. Yeah. And I think it gives someone a more, more empathy right. and a greater understanding right. and maybe even a greater mission. To right. help others overcome, we shall overcome. Right, because um, they've had trauma or, or problems in their life, yeah. and they're like, okay, they're well, not complacent. Yeah, or they they're to affect they, change. they feel comfortable actually in that difficult zone that you yeah. have to go in to advocate or yeah. or to put forward a statement that may be a little controversial or exactly. unaccepted. So the other thing, um, the other quote that I loved was he said, "I'm 38 years old. I know I'm risking my life." Yeah. But if I don't risk my life, then I haven't really lived. Right. You know, so he knew he he was high risk. He had to. Yes. For himself, he was compelled to take on this mission because right. he knew he could help. Right. 
And he almost felt like, well, I have to help. Right. If I turn away from this now, right. then I haven't lived. Right. You know, so he'd be letting himself down, which right. I just thought. I just I, it was so, so much, inspiring. I so much love for him, never having met him. Right. I, I'm just in awe. You know what I found interesting, too, and that a lot of people associated with just African Americans or black, um, the black families or whatever that he was trying to move forward but he really advocated for everybody yeah he, you know and it was interesting because i think there's a misconception that it you know it's just about he was advocating for african americans or I blacks know, I've and, never... you know but at, in some of the stuff that i read you know early on the statements may have looked like that but really as i kept reading it was really more about equality for everybody right. now, it doesn't rights. matter yes yeah, no, civil he's rights. trying to make united states a better place. Yes. And and in a very one of volatile things, time. Absolutely. Yeah. And one of the, and I know he when he was just a minister, mm -hmm. um, um, Rosa Parks. Yes. Worked for N NAACP, got on the bus, was tired, didn't want to move. Right. And he, she was brought to his church, to meet, to talk about this. That's when he came into the movement. So ah. he hadn't been in there originally. And that kind of was the door opener that was that the, the inspiration or he that saw i i can help here this right. is what i'm called to do right um the other thing is um part of when i was uh chair of the youth commission and we did the martin luther king day of service yes for many years the the quote that i love is um from martin luther king jr life's most persistent question is what are you doing for others? Right. He's not saying, what am I doing for the people that are my people right. that I'm trying to free from right. oppression? It's really everyone. And that's right. why I consider him my one of my heroes. Oh, in sure. He I mean, actually, both of us volunteer. I exactly. mean, we give back. We, we want do. to, yeah. He's, he's, he is my dad's age. Yeah. So my dad turned um, 89 on January 4th, mm -hmm. and Martin Luther King is January 15th. So. Uh, 89 you know i think if he were still alive today right we would be so blessed right and 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 may not be in in the place we are now right but he does have people speaking um for him i wanted to mention yes please, framingham yeah. state mm -hmm. had some protests because unfortunately they are having so. some racist slurs yes written on people's doors yeah, written on that. buildings yeah. it just gives so me unfortunate it, uh, just, and, uh, it makes no uh, sense to uh, me i know and it just <laughs> it's just unbelievable but they had people, kids, who felt strongly and empowered. Yes. Um, one, one girl named Isla Driggs, in particular, beautiful, beautiful black woman um, student, spoke out and it says um, nearly 100 gathered um, to talk about hateful and racist graffiti targeting minorities Good. over the past three months. Good. So it's still happening. Right. But now um, people feel in, you know, able to speak up. School is offering a $5,000 reward for any information. Excellent. Um, and then she, Driggs quoted that, again, judged by the color of their skin, not by the color of their skin, sorry, but the content of their character. Um, but they're worried about safety. Right. And they're, they're, they shouldn't be treated differently or unequally. There right. was another young, uh, young man um, who's there, and he, and he said, you know what? We pay a lot of money to come here to study, and we shouldn't have to worry about racist slurs being written on our door. Sophomore Jordan Privet Jackson returned to his dorm and found a racist note written right. on the dorm. Um, you know, so again, his quote, as human beings, we should be disgusted and ashamed by the lack of unity within our people. We should feel saddened by the ignorance of our people as well. It is ridiculous to pay thousands of dollars to go to the school and face racism every day. Right. I came here for an education not to be hated. And right. this is in the north. Yeah, you know, it's, it's so just, bizarre. I mean, it's just I. I mean, how dare you, because of the way a certain person looks or whatever their nationality is, right. think you're better than them, or you feel the right that you can, you know, hurt them, you know, by by publicly, you know, disparaging whatever their race is or writing swastikas or whatever. It's such a very bizarre. Behavior. Well, I mean, I don't like it. I, I find it hard. You know, you work with children and I have yeah. a young child and I 
you know, my daughter asked me why, why would someone even do that? And I don't, you know, like I struggle with that all the time. Is it coming from home? I mean, it's, I, I don't think it's coming from the schools. I mean, we didn't, you know, even a lot, as long ago as I was in school, you know, yeah. in Idaho, mm -hmm. we, we didn't, there was, you know, there was racism in that, you know, the generation we kind of grew up in, there was definitely mm -hmm. more of that before us. But, you know, my daughter asked, she's like, I don't understand. Right. What makes someone think that they have the right when they don't even know the person? I mean, I mean, laws... Um, take care of people that do bad things. Schools, they have rules if people don't follow the rules or they and break they the rules. And they have counselors and they right. have Right, so, so that's lessons. where that's where the justice happens and yeah. that's the way our society is built. So why does a private citizen or a student or somebody else feel that it's their right or that they should bring forth this hate? I mean, it's well, just that, very, I mean, like, to me, I don't understand it. Yeah. You know? One thing, another thing that happened on, um, on the ML, at the MLK Day mm -hmm. cel uh, celebration um, run by the Youth Commission was there were some people who meditated. Mm -hmm. And um, I hope they call in because I'm now going to forget <laughs> the name. But uh, the young man who did this was wonderful. Mm -hmm. He talked, he asked the crowd, you know, the group of kids assembled, why do people do this? Right. And some people said fear. Oh. And, and, and not, yeah. not for a student necessarily, um, but for a, a worker, you know, and talking about immigrants, yeah. they may fear losing their job if, right. the, if other people right. come in and, and take the jobs. You right. know, so immigrants, if an immigrant's willing to take less yeah. money, but I don't know. It, it doesn't what... make sense to me. But, I mean, and I can understand, you know, people trying to have their livelihood. But again, I mean, free market, I mean, for one, people shouldn't, I mean, that's part of why the immigration, you know, thing, you know, people get green cards and why they come here. And yeah. I mean, there should be a, a really fair way to have people immigrate into our country and work. Everywhere you drive around here, right. there's there's jobs. So like if you're fearful of someone taking your job, then go go get a, <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Like look at a job. So it's just, you know, I, I have a hard time with that that reasoning were there any other reasons that they came up with well this and they, i mean like they to me, fear because maybe and, what maybe, they're seeing in the news and or, someone else did mention that um maybe they grew up with that as right. you were saying so maybe it's passed down oh craig is watching on facebook and gave us a like thanks craig thank you craig um so maybe grandmother talked about something that she right. learned from her youth and it just hasn't been corrected in, right. in her mind somehow um so they talked about the fear-based people that were just, you know, and also sometimes some of it is ignorance as in not knowing. So if you don't understand, if you don't know yeah. that someone who looks different is the same, right? you know, then you, I, then I you can... may treat them differently. Right. Um, and, and if you're a person who judges on the external, right, then you're stuck with that. And that's unfortunately, right. Um, you know, again, judging not by the color of their skin. So, right. so actually, um, you know, people, people might judge, I, I think there's reverse racism. Oh, I sure. think there are black people who judge white people in a sure. certain way. And I think, oh, that's humans. So but it's I think, humans. Yeah. You know, I, I think we want to find fault or we want to, we don't understand. So we, we look at things like that. But yeah. And it's also a categorization, you know, we're noticing a difference and we're putting it in that box. Right. But I think we're at the end of this segment, oh. which we could probably talk about this for a very long time. Yeah. Um, but, but thank you. And, yeah, um, and, and feel free to send uh, an email to yes. live at hcam.tv. If you have something you want to say, we could bring it up at another time. Absolutely. Yep. And we'll be back in a couple of minutes to talk about Trump's tough talk. Yes. Thank you so much. Do you find yourself feeling down in winter? Or if you experience depression through the year, does it get worse in the colder and darker months? I'm here to tell you about winter depression and what you can do that may be helpful. Seasonal affective disorder, or SAD, is a type of depression that tends to occur in the fall. You may lose your energy and motivation. You may feel sluggish, agitated, distracted, hopeless, and you may have problems with sleeping, your appetite, or suicidal thoughts. SAD can lead to social withdrawal, problems with school or work, and substance abuse. Here's the good news. 
you can talk with your primary care physician, your psychiatrist, or mental health professional. There are effective treatments such as counseling, light box therapy, or medication. Sometimes we feel bad in the fall and winter anyway, especially during the holidays. But if a mood slump continues for days or weeks, don't wait. Talk with your doctor or counselor for more information and support. This week, uh, Wake Up and uh, Smell the Poetry. Ancestors, so I'd like to just take a moment yeah, from to poet thank my father activist, for his service in Ray World War II and his brother, my uncle, and my grandfather, Jack, uh, as well as his brother, David, and his brother, Joshua, who died 100 years ago today in World War I trying to free a comrade that was stuck in barbed wire. Welcome back to the Margie and Lisa show, and we are now gonna talk about Trump's tough talk. Mm -hmm. Is it an opportunity or is it outrageous? Right, and I mean, if you guys, I know everybody this has strong opinions about this, um, and we would really love to hear your opinion on yeah. this. because please call in. Yeah, please call in or, or type in a message yeah. into Facebook just so we have a balanced conversation. Um, you know, it, it you know we just came off the Martin Luther King segment and it's kind of interesting because a lot of the 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 news casts out there it feels like you know the Trump administration is being painted as racist and and the way the words come out but as how is that perceived I mean I guess that's that's what I look at I try to look at it objectively and I'm like well you know it's 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 a tough tough thing because the words I hear and you know and then on the other hand he says he's not racist I have a hard time just you know judging people or countries I've been to Africa I've been to Botswana Zimbabwe Zambia South Africa and the people were so polite and and one of my best think friends is Kenyan so yeah. I mean there's there there's I don't even a lot think of, that's the question yeah I think I think like, the issue is um Trump has a style yes and if you look at the Apprentice, which I never watched, but I I, never did, I've yeah. seen advertisements. Me too, yeah. It, his style is tough. Right. You know, if you don't agree or you don't do what he wants, you're fired. Right. I think the reason people are having trouble saying exactly the words they heard yes. is because he has spoken to them on the side and said, just say you don't know what I said or I don't know what's right. happening. Um, but to have some people saying, this is exactly what he said. Right. And other people saying, well, I'm not sure. Right, and Everyone other... was kind of talking tough. Right. You know, so right. So I think part of it's Who his style. Who did the inference? I mean, like, I think it's okay to be tough on things. And I, I personally have voiced opinions very tough about social issues and, and certain things, you know, certain beliefs. And I mean, certainly I have some agreements with the Republican platform and the Democratic platform. And, you know, I come from a very Republican state and I, I'm kind of, I'm fiscally conservative. Um, but the thing is, is some of this, the things I read and what I see in the news and, and when I listen to Trump speak, I have just that feeling that I, I just don't agree with what he says. And I guess that's, you know, in my heart of hearts. And I mean, you can, you can say one thing, but your actions and your words, they, 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 have, they have value. And when you're the president of the United States, you have to represent all of your people. You know, I mean, you, you may disagree with certain part, groups, and I know you have to have tough talk, and we have to make tough decisions, but, like, you represent everybody. Right. And I know they talk about, well, he's speaking to his constituency, but... I don't think so. I think he's saying what he wants to say, yeah. coming from what he thinks. Yeah. And, you know, his doctor said that he's... He's very good intellectually, or yeah. he's you know he's he's got a, everything's going well in in his medical situation. Yeah. I think he's just a person who expresses himself in a very uh, you know no holds barred. This is what I think, and it's going to come out however it comes out manner. Right. So his base may be appreciative of that. Right. Um, they they want the tough stance, but. You know, is I'm not is, opposed to the tough stance if it makes sense. I mean that you know, I, I think, you know, running government's a very difficult thing, but being the president, you just have to be a little bit more thoughtful about the way you speak and actually do some research behind what you're speaking about. You know, one thing that I found that was very profound that there was over two thousand proven lying statements that were wrong it, before his first year of 
predis- being well, the president. Even, even so just, that, that to me is a very difficult, yeah. you know. But that's no. But no one disagrees with that. Yeah. I mean, even just the picture of him saying, "I had the biggest crowd," and he obviously didn't have the biggest right, crowd. But he just like that's his style to say, "I'm the best. I'm the the least racist person you ever interviewed," right. which is not true. Um, but I wanted to mention that um, he. I think what gave me some hope here yeah. is that Bernice King, mm-hmm. Martin Luther King's youngest child, yes. said, "Because." racism has been opened up again right it's an opportunity oh I so agree. let's talk about yeah racism i think it these people them. have unmasked themselves as racist if they we're gonna say haiti and you know name countries that are of other races haiti africa are whatever right. he said tough talk yeah countries if he's gonna say then other people are gonna say oh yeah i'm not what yeah okay so really what's happening is we're unmasking the racism right. Bernice King, God bless her, said this is an opportunity. Right. So if we look at it that way, right. and that's there what is I'm, some hope. I've been telling my daughter that. I mean, that apathy that I talked about in the last right. segment, I think this is making people pay attention. Yep. Take that Band-Aid yeah, right off. Yeah, there. take the Band-Aid off, talk about it, bring these issues to the forefront, and discuss them. Right. We we do live in America, the United States. We can say what we want. We can. We have free speech. Um, you know, I think it's really important that all of us discuss this. And that was one thing I brought out to my daughter because, you know, I've had a lot of conversations with her and she doesn't understand why this, these things come up and these words come out. And I say, well, you know what, this is a good thing because then the discussion happens. Exactly. The, you know, we look at these things and, and maybe we thought we were in a different place than we were. And I mean, well, like, and that's exactly her point. Bernice's point was yeah. we thought... Yeah. That our country was more advanced right. than it was in the 60s because maybe some of it went underground right. and put a, you know, nice bow on it and looked like it's okay. Right. But it's not okay. If it, it was all bu- those it bubbled people, up. Exactly. Yeah. If all those people supported this tough talking not great example of manners person, yeah. I'm just going to say. Yeah. Um then maybe they are similar and it's just been buried and right. and you know, when you validate a person's inclination towards something yes. by having it publicly you know sure. i do this right. so why don't you do this right. then any little piece of that that you had you say well he did it and he's president right. so it must be okay right and that's that's i guess the worries because you've yeah. seen uh you know in freedom of speech again but you know white supremacists have definitely come out right. more vocally and more publicly so that's definitely but that again, doors, but that's a good thing right. because I I didn't think it was as prevalent as it was. All right, so Mike um, sent an email which I really appreciate because I think this is what's happening. Mike thinks we aren't used to hearing straight talk from a president. Right. We've been so used or to any listening politician. to politicians, yeah, any politicians that talk around subjects. Yeah. He's a businessman that is a straight talker, and I think that is very true. I think that's what people are saying. Hey, we talk like that. Right. And we think like that. He just says it. Right. You know, so. But so, And then you represent a constituency and you represent a certain right. part of, I mean, that's what you do as a, a politician or an elected official is right. represent, you know, a certain segment or as much as you can. But I think that tough talk is fine. And, I, you know, I believe in tough talk and I think it's very important to be honest. And, you know, I do believe um politicians are very polished and they you know they they're given a certain amount of, you know like they have a, a rhetoric that they follow or they have a they have to follow their party lines and they have to you know meet a voter base with some very basic information but what i have issue is is really the the lying and the the mistruths or misinformation right. that that's yeah. where i mean if i did that in my work i would have a lot of problems right you know i mean even and that's in a, a really whole nother subject right. as in but a miscommunication i mean that's a yeah. huge thing i mean you mean it, like fake news yeah <laughs> right but again it's you know yep. like it that is a, a thing that i feel very strongly about that you know at least make sure the information is correct mm-hmm. um thank you jonathan jonathan just reminded me that the name of the um man at the mlk uh celebration is seth monk He's from Andover, oh. um, and he was wonderful uh, facilitating our, our um, 
seeds of peace conversation Excellent. and he, he led a meditation um it was fabulous thank you jonathan um so that was seth monk and another thing you know like talking about this subject and i think you know something i saw on, on facebook of all things today is like you know don't hate the person that believes something different than you try to bridge that gap and that goes back to or, martin luther king's yeah, message yeah. you know it's very easy to get angry at these things and don't understand why someone's coming across with this information um they may believe it you listen to them and maybe you talk back but you you may have a conversation and i'm not saying talk back but just debate Look for something in it's common. like debate and maybe yeah. say i mean i think most people in this world really want what's best for their families they want jobs they want right they want equality yep. they want and i don't think you know i i think the majority of people i mean i talked to my family in idaho they're big trump supporters <laughs> They are not seeing the side of that that I see. So, I mean, we have the discussion. It's right. a little tumultuous, you know, because mm -hmm. we're very straight talkers. Mm -hmm. um, but again, that's, you know, I think that's, you know, if there's a lesson from this is to unite as a country. I mean, we right. may and have... keep the communication open, yes, too. Yes, and, and not shut them down or right. block them on Facebook or not talk to your True. friends anymore. Keep or, it open. Yeah, continue with the conversation. So one of the things that concerns me in, in that regard is the fact that Nikki Haley... Yeah. Uh, who's supposed to be the our UN, yeah, yeah, Homeland right. Security person, yeah. said um, that she couldn't recall the specific oh. language when she was asked. Then she said there were 12 people, there was crosstalk. She didn't dispute the tough language. But she said, instead of answering directly, and I'm pretty sure she was told not to, Yeah. and she's, I feel bad for her, and I yeah. feel bad for Sarah you know, Huckabee, the, yeah. Huckabee Sanders, because yeah. they have to talk that party line, yeah. and they're probably dying inside because they know they're not telling the truth but they're just avoiding the question because right. she's referred to the general profanity in the room, you know, saying everyone was talking like that. And someone said, well, to Dick Durbin, were you ta were you swearing? And he said, no. Yeah. So it's, you know, what does that mean exactly? Right. And then Senator Cory Booker was furious right. in New Jersey. I was so proud of him and so grateful, right. um, you know, saying your silence and your amnesia is complicity. She is not right. calling out what happened she's trying to avoid it because of her job and i understand that but right. she's not standing up she's backing down right and hiding because of fear or whatever uh, almost anything. that that thing that we are talking about why people don't stand up it, that's that. happening in our public officials i mean right. they're they're afraid to you know yep. say something that may affect their job or the way they're treated or or whatever and unfortunately and maybe back to uh, Martin Luther King's daughter saying that maybe this is an opportunity exactly within the parties for people to speak up if they don't agree with something you can't be so tied into the party line because then why are you or, in that or, position or you know? bullied right. to the point that you you don't want to right. speak because that's, that's you're what afraid. it feels like it's I mean it that, that's what it feels like it's and that's back is. to back to Martin Luther King day of, of being able right. to say your opinion mm -hmm. bring it forth and talk about you know what your beliefs are and, yep. and i mean isn't that why you're elected to a position i mean people believe you're gonna you're gonna advocate or you're gonna share some of your opinion i mean granny you follow some of your party right. lines and your beliefs but if you see something that's wrong that's your responsibility right and right. that's it i mean like when you're sworn in i mean even for our town our, our town committees that we serve on same thing you're sworn in to speak to really to be the best of us yes and um you know maybe maybe they like that he's a great deal maker which supposedly he is because the part of it maybe he just bullies people i don't know but um <laughs> this the government to be shutdown seen. was threatened yeah. because there are three things that they can't come to agreement sure. on the border wall daca and the child health chip. protection chip which seems um, absurd i mean right like but they're not agreeing and there's a threatened the january Government 19th deadline down. is created by donald trump yep he's the one that said you have to agree by this date or we shut it down right um and and this is his style his right. a little right. bit of a bullying I, style I like, I like deadlines i mean i work yep. within deadlines um because i work for the state and deadlines are good. I, I honestly like deadlines, but you have to negotiate. Exactly. You, you know what I mean? And it seems like so bizarre to me, like 
the child insurance program, Why wouldn't you health insurance that? program, and and DACA. I mean, he claims that he loves DACA and it's a wonderful program and blah well, blah blah. One day, yeah, but then, then they want day. they want you know funding for the wall. I mean, I understand that's the nature of, but why are those tied together? I mean, to me, that's where I have issues with with politics and bills right. that come forward. Why are you tying, marrying things together that really <laughs> don't belong? I mean, they, like, I know it's part of negotiation. I know it's part of government, but why not do it separately. Well, and Why also do you tie in making these a deal, to, yeah. making a deal, you have to give a little to get a little. Right. So I don't see uh, any give. Yeah. I just see this is what we want. You're not cooperating, so you're the ones not dealing. Right. But it isn't. It. I. I just in my humble opinion, it doesn't look to me like the Democrats are withholding no. agreement. It looks like they're not. The two sides are not working together. Right. So I just have to read this one thing. Um, Emily Swanson from the Associated Press gave this whole article about how Trump ends the first year with the lowest average approval rating ever ever <laughs> um, of any elected pre president in the first year yeah. um, average is 39 percent approval previous low was Bill Clinton whose first year average was 10 points higher yeah. um, bright spot obviously is the economy the economy keeps growing growing right. growing I don't know if his base is you know, maybe maybe they're all investing in the stock market because it right. boosts the economy because they want Trump to succeed, which is not a bad right. thing. I Thank mean, you, Stephen, for watching on Facebook. Yeah, I think, you know, back to the stock market, I mean, certainly I have a little bit in there, not a lot, but I think the average citizen, they say that only a very small percentage of people are going to benefit from the stock market. I mean, I have a mutual fund that's very, you know, it's my retirement fund, you know what I mean? So I see little dips going up and up and but I mean that can change and I have an issue with the tax policy that's came forward oh my goodness because yeah. it almost is setting up the mm -hmm. the whoever comes into office after the eight years mm -hmm. up to fail mm -hmm. so it's like buying votes or buying something that feels like it's it's just not I ugh, I, I just agree. you know like I, I really believe that it needs to be done for the greater good it can't be a band-aid you can't you know, it just, it, well, and the and way also, it was shoved through. Right. I mean, and I know uh, the Affordable Care Act was not, it was bipartisan the way it went through, but that's a whole different ball. You know, I just. Eh. Well, and also what what's going to happen to health care? Right. Health care, taxes, right. single moms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Trump, this one, in the Quinnipiac poll, voters were more likely to say Trump is helping the economy than hurting it. On the other hand, more said President Barack Obama deserves the credit than Trump does. Sure. I so mean, it's thought, only a year out. And I mean, right. his policy really hasn't been enacted. I mean, really, true. the tax policy That's is true. coming in in 2018. So this so, is Obama. Yeah, this is still left over from Obama. I mean, and or many things, not just that president, but that administration and the things that they've yep. done. And then 23% said he has kept the president, the promises he made. 30% said he's tried and failed. 45% says he hasn't done anything. Right. Um, and then down here, the end of the article, she said it may be character more than policy that's driving negative opinions. Sure. Um, most voters said Trump is not level-headed, honest, or even fit to serve as president. Two-thirds of Americans thought that the country has become even more divided as a result of his presidency. Yeah, I, I think we agree on that. Yeah. And then um, most those who disapproved, this is the Gallup poll in July, most cited personality or character over issues, policies, or overall performance. So I think that the challenge is, how do we move forward given that this is the person we have for The president? personality. And yeah. I mean, you do understand that all of us have had people that are difficult to work with. Some of the people I've worked with in the past, they're the most difficult I learned the most from. Well, that's true. And you I, know, I, I and, keep and, trying to look for the bright thing. Yeah. But on that note, we yeah. actually have to stop. Yes. And so, <laughs> right. It, we, yeah. Time flies. So we're going to be back in a couple of minutes with... Yeah. Uh, Beth Malloy and Leslie Mann are going to talk with us about what's happening with Greyhound Friends. Should it reopen or not? Yes. See thank you back. You. This week on The Senior View, Ray McLeod talks to Gail Clifford and John Palmer again about all the monuments on the common. Of, mm -hmm, the brass pl uh, bronze plaque. This was put in position at the end of August and the dedication was held at the Congregational Church across the street. And they would have held it on the common except that the weather was very bad. So. Uh, this, this project will go a long way 
to bring in those same benefits to the town of Hopkinton. So thank you all, and I look this forward week to on HKM. continued development. Mass Dot holds a public hearing Thank about you. the downtown corridor project uh, next, at I'd the like senior center. Joe Bennett, acting police chief, to come up. I know this project has began in 1957. I've only been participating with the police department since the early 90s on this project, and we're very excited to see this come to fruition. This week on the Golden Pan, Lisa and Mary connect us with Don and Beverly Moberg to make shish kebabs and pilaf. The meat gonna cook faster. The meat will cook faster. Okay, so we should put the chicken on first. Yeah. All right, Mary. So we're just putting it. So you said that it's closer to the edge. Right. So we can have so easy can access to that little. We want to be able to turn it on. And Welcome back. <laughs> Um, we actually have a caller on the line, so before we get to our guest, um, let's take our call. Stephen, hello. Hi, how are you guys doing this evening? Great, how are you? Good. Thanks for calling. Very well. Uh, I apologize, I wasn't able to get there in person, but I, I was hoping I could call in and share some information regarding Anytime. Right Perfect. Yeah. Or answer any questions anyone may have. All right, thank you. Regarding Greyhound Friends? Yes, yes. Perfect. Excellent. All right, we appreciate uh, we're that. And, um, yeah. and this is Leslie Doyle, not Leslie Mann. I apologize yeah. for the confusion. <laughs> All right, yep. so what we have, um, we have Beth Malloy and Leslie Doyle here. And yep. we'd like to hear a little bit about um, what happened with Greyhound Friends um, in the court case and then um, why you feel that it should not be reopened. And um, Stephen sure. can jump in after you guys explain a little bit mm -hmm. thank you for joining us yeah, thank, thank you, you. Um, I, I guess what mainly is a lot of people thought that once the court case was case was done that was a done deal and that's that's not the case at all um, they need to stand before our board of selectmen and go through a process before they can obtain their kennel license back sure. we've gotten together and started the Facebook page stand up for candy which is one of the dogs that came out of Greyhound um, in order to share information facts we're not sharing feelings as much as we're sharing facts Good. provided Perfect. to us by the state yeah um and it's our hope to inform the people of hopkinton and surrounding towns as to what went on there because i can honestly say i was blind to it myself yeah. and um we don't know either. we wouldn't I mean, see that the kennel is not you know it's tucked behind mm -hmm. um a, a wooded sort of area and rocks right, right. on saddle hill road um, so no one can see it. It's not Unless like they you're pass on site. Yeah, you, you, wouldn't, yeah. you wouldn't know. And like if with us, I mean, just pretend like we're kind of a green audience, you know, like in, in the people. I like at, green. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so many ways, but go ahead. There was, there are definitely some things that need to be done to the kennel. People think, oh, just slap up a coat of paint mm. and fix up some of the um, lighting or whatever, and it's a done deal. It's so... That's different than so animal welfare, though. That, much farther, yeah, yes. That's that's. So different. tell us a few of the things that you think need to be done, if if she were to reopen, can we it do is, that? To um, on a list. I, I, if if I had to say that this place was to reopen, Top I would. 10, yeah, I would replace the the entire board of directors. Oh. And uh, completely sweep the cl the place clean of all the workers that were in there, and come in. I would rather see a brand new rescue go in. Okay, that's so you're so feeling. you're that's saying strong. even if you f you band aid the things that are wrong physically, mm -hmm. it's the management that Absolutely. is the problem. Okay, Absolutely. I hear you. Um, and it, it, it this isn't a new um, problem. It's not something that had been going on for the last ten years. It's something that's been going on for thirty years. Aww. We encounter yeah, a lot of the records. I mean, so they've been they've been in business how long? Um, a little more than 30 years. Okay. Um, they, during that time, they received three cease and desist orders to stop operating, multiple shutdowns, fines, and From the animal control officer, or board of health, um, or? Be between the town and, MSPCA. The, and the state. Um, okay. They've had MSPCA in there urging them to change the ways Animal Rescue League has tried for years to get them to improve the animal welfare. So I think this actually would be a good time to show the pictures, right? Yeah. Yes. So can yeah. we uh, can we pull up the pictures that um, that Leslie brought in at this time? So we're just going to see some of the dogs and, and maybe some of the conditions that they're in. This is a beautiful brindle, brindle greyhound. Yep. 
So this is Mo. So sadly, um, a report just came out about tent from the state um, veteran veterinarian and um, Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources about Katie Brown. Or? Um, no, um, Linda Harrod, who's the animal oh, sure. inspector, just, yeah. um, about 10 dogs, 10 sick and injured dogs at Greyhound Friends who um, Greyhound Friends did not provide um, appropriate medical care to, including this dog, Mo, who had an aggressive form of cancer and they left untreated for two months. And is this the one that had the foot? Yes. 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 So it's so so it spread beyond just the toe area into the foot and the leg. Is that well? He I'm ended up having his toe amputated, yeah. um, and you yeah. know it's just to me. I mean, I was in the inside. I was a board member for a year. This is an organization that took in three point five million dollars. Oh, and the so they have that. That's the yeah. was my follow up question. Is that a Do grant? That is that a grant? That, where does the money in come the, from? Donations. donations. That's a that's. That annually is that? That's over the so last. So they have adequate five funds years. to provide. That's services. that's a lot of funding. I mean, I know what I do. <laughs> I know what I do with my funding, and I don't get that kind of money. Yeah, it's and incredible. Yeah, so. so how many dogs do they typically have there at one time? How much? How many should they have? How many? How many do they have? Did they? Well, have? that's an interesting question. Um, 40, they were told in when they were closed by the state. that they were um, they they were continually overcrowding, which is a real problem because it can further the spread of disease, and it's also very stressful for the dogs. The town, I think, what's really sad is this community has worked so hard to try right. and work with them of and course. get them to cooperate so that they could continue operating. They were told in 1999, after many many problems, yep. if you exceed your kennel license again we're gonna permanently suspend your license. Right. They've been caught violating that. So they did they did exceed then. it. So when yeah. they exceed it, it does that mean they have how many how many are they supposed to have? Um, their For license when they closed was thirty dogs. License was thirty. Yes. Ten were very sick. How many did they have in space? It varied. Sometimes 40, up to forty. They were cramming them into every I've corner seen them in sometimes. Little rooms. Yeah. All right. We have two um, messages. One is Maureen, who says she agrees with Beth on starting from scratch. Um, and then Joanna says Greyhound Friends should never be allowed to reopen. Stephen, do you have anything yeah, you want to add at this point? Well, I, I would like to go on to say that um, I believe they had forty-seven dogs when they were closed. The kennel was built to house twenty dogs. Um, what they were doing is they were they were Holding them into little crates in the in the medical room. They were holding them in the laundry room, in the kitchen area. Shower, um, I heard. Two dogs. Yeah, in the, the shower room. area. I mean, I I personally helped pull uh, Emma, a sick dog, out of there January of last year before their last cease and desist order. Emma sat there for two months, heartworm positive with uh, uh, disease as well. They did not treat her. The vet didn't see her. Um, and it wasn't until we walked in, were asked to help, uh, when we asked for the heartworm test, that they did it. And then they told me that she was heartworm positive. It was basically Emma would have died there had we not taken her. That's Thank kind of you a for simple taking her. thing to take so care of. So let me of. ask, heartworm is contagious, is it not? Absolutely. Doesn't it pass from dog to dog? But and then I also read, care. I read I mean, that they are, <laughs> they are also <laughs> letting the dogs all do their business in the same area, so then they would pass the wherever. Yeah. Would pass through the right. feces. So, so yeah. it's a monthly $11 pill that right. dogs Indeed. weren't getting, which makes no 35 sense. 35 million, what did you say? 3.5 3. 3. 5 million. 3.5 million, and it's $11 pill. Right, wow. and so you're you're bringing dogs in from out of state. Towards the end, she, she was taking in dogs every because she, two weeks. Okay. The dogs were supposed to go into an isolation chamber yeah, sure. and, and stay there for a certain that's amount of days the until they determine if they're yeah. contagious or right. what's happening. But of course, while they were in the isolation, they were also going out and doing their business next to the resident dogs, yeah. which kind well, of blows the whole so, isolation right. thing. So they right. spread whatever. Exactly. Now and, Kelly, and Kelly on Facebook says Louise Coleman should not be allowed to ever be involved again. I agree. Stephen, do you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. I think. I think Ms. Coleman should retire. Uh, yes, I think that uh, you know things went astray there so far, not just with the dog, but with the finances. 
Yeah. Right. That's cool. what I was wondering because, like, anytime you work, have a nonprofit, I work with many, many nonprofits. Literally, every penny needs to be accounted for, right. and the idea of a nonprofit at the end of the year is you come up with zeros. <laughs> you you, you yeah. know what I mean? When you have a certain budget that you follow, that's what that's yeah. what you come up so, with. So that's the, again the Steve, financial Steve, issue. Steve, can I ask? Are you Steve Bassignani? From I am from Franklin. Did I say it right? Frank yes, Monroe. you did. Bassignani. I love Italian. I got to take that language. <laughs> so what I'm, I'm, I'm looking. I brought your letter to the editor in, and this is part of why we we picked this subject was because of your articulate letter to the Hopkinton Independent, um, where you, you talked about Emma, um, yep. who, and it just broke my heart. Emma was filthy, covered in engorged ticks. Um, mm -hmm. oh. It's just giving me chills. Advanced heartworm. Uh, the poor thing, you know, and, and you took her home to help her. Um, and then the, your last, your last very articulate paragraph, um, Greyhound Friends, Friends claims they should be allowed to reopen because they, after many warnings, finally cleaned the kennel. But if they do not prioritize the health and welfare of the dogs, that's a serious disconnect that cannot be fixed simply by sprucing up the kennel with new paint and new promises. Mm -hmm. I love what you said, Stephen. Very, very Thank articulate, you. very to the point. Well, for someone that owns animals, that's just basic animal husbandry. That's what you do. I mean, oh, you give your... And you don't ever miss husband. one single one. Well, I mean, it's so easy now, and it's not expensive. I have four horses, and it's not that expensive to warm my horses and get their vaccines and do all the things that you do as an animal owner, a responsible animal owner. And, I mean, certainly if you're giving these animals up for adoption, I mean, that that is a, you know, like... The basic care is, is so simple and it so should I, be I budgeted. Have, I have more here. Um, Kelly on Facebook says, I visited there in 2010. There were dogs everywhere, the offices, every room beyond the kennel itself. Maureen says, I agree, Kelly, she should not be allowed to profit from her book. I didn't know she wrote a book. Oh, yeah. And, um, and then uh, there are two more dog pictures. I don't know if we should bring those up now. Um, the profits from her book should go to the places that took the sick and stressed dogs, is what oh, Maureen yeah. says. And James wants to know what does it mean that the court case was dismissed, which I'll respond right. to in a minute. Oh, so here's yeah. another picture of some of the dogs. Stephen, did you yeah. want to add something? Is this there? Is this yeah. outside? Yes. No, it's I'm, the shower. Uh, no. no, I mean, I'm here to answer any questions you guys may have for me, uh, you know, experience that I've been involved with, with great home friends or staff supporters. I mean, if we go back to the money, we can find out that she paid her landlord forty-five thousand dollars quote unquote for website work. Oh, that's absurd! Crazy <laughs> because he claims he claims he's a volunteer. I'm a volunteer for Pity Love. I would never accept a dime There's for any of the dog. work that I do. Yeah, uh, who's this? You know, this she, is she paid. Oh, that's hope. She paid a breeder in Connecticut forty-seven thousand dollars for quote unquote transport uh, in twenty fifteen. Um, That's, that seems like it should kind of be a federal violation of nonprofit 501c3. I don't know. Well, they're, under, well, they're, under, they're under investigation by the Attorney General's yeah, office. Yeah, because so that, let me, again, let me read, goes um, back to I did find the um, Hopkins Inquirer of, yeah. um, article from February, December 8th when she was under acquitted. Um, and the judge, yeah, David Kunis, found Coleman not guilty of the charge filed yeah. against her by the Animal yeah. Rescue League. The evidence falls far short of establishing that she violated a crim criminal statute. And then on the second page, it says that um, the Cunis ru ruling again said um, Coleman should be commended for her work saving dogs. While there has been some evidence that Greyhound Friends should have, could have improved sanitary conditions, there was also much credible evidence that the shelter was generally a safe and healthy environment. This was a rescue shelter, and evidence showed many of the dogs that arrived there had already experienced much mistreatment and trauma um but then on the other side it's also saying that what the 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 other attorney was talking about coleman not complying with isolation procedures would um the dogs all use the same turnout area spread disease cracks in the floor worn out floors rusty cages um and, and if you understand the dogs were actually there were holes in the um the kennels were cement up to a certain point mm -hmm. and then it was like a chain link fence that rescue was originally built for beagles oh, so the beagles so, so the beagles are short right. well they can stand up and see each other there was a guillotine door um raised so a dog could go 
outside to do their thing and sleep on the other. They had the guillotine door down. They had dogs on both sides. They were overcrowded wow. to the max. Okay. Yeah. And so when a dog is in a stressful That's situation, so much disease mm -hmm. too. Um, yeah. them being able to see each other and you could see through the guillotine door, you could jump up and see um, over the top of these things. There were claw marks, there were um, big chunks of cement that, that were missing. And yep. imagine all the urine and all the feces just being absorbed into that Yeah, there's no way to, that cement. to get rid of that contamination. You would have to completely have somebody come in like a fire and come in and clean and seal oh, the seal entire it. thing. Yeah, I mean, that's um, basic. Some of, the, some of the breaks in the chain link fences, the gates and whatnot, they just took like pieces of wire and put them through and twisted them off. And right. the dogs could get cut on them. I mean, the yeah. whole thing, it, it was... It, they were barely so, slapping band-aids on it. So, so but if you have that much money, too, it seems absolutely ridiculous that you can't, you know, yeah. deal with those. I mean, I manage my farm, and I know, sure. yeah, you know, it's not perfect, but, it, you know, like, you can invest when you have that much money. I, I don't know. But I don't know what I would do with my farm, you know, with that I think much money. Stephen, you know? Stephen said there's a disconnect. Yep. There's a disconnect, right, yep. Stephen? So, clearly, <laughs> I think, you know, it seems to me that this, here's a, a person, Louise Coleman. I believe she has a good heart and a heart for animals, but she just yep. isn't noticing or she doesn't realize or it's clearly <clears throat> neglect. I don't know why <clears throat> there's the neglect. Yeah. Um, I, but I would say, I would say, and what about because the Wait, Steven, Sorry. go yeah. ahead, Steven. I was going to say, normally the public does not see the back rooms and the back kennels in the ISO area. Right. And when right. you walk into Grey on Friends, it looks full. The, the land is beautiful, the front loan looks beautiful, but unless you know what you're looking for, unless you, yeah. you know, in the dog right. world, right. I believe that's the reason why Judge Kuhn has said what he said. Right. Because yeah. the folks who are in this rest world, and I've only been in it a couple of years now, understand yeah. what it takes to what this safe environment and a healthy right. environment for these dogs that suffer and continue to suffer. Right, and it's, that's just heartbreaking. And there was... Yeah, and I think, I, again, the public doesn't see what really goes on in the back rooms, and you don't really see, nobody looks at the finances unless there's a problem. The 990s, well, that's which public they record. Did. I mean, the, it will the, be but, when they put in their 2000s. But I didn't, I didn't look in the public oh, record until I pulled them out. You know, minute. nobody, nobody's going to look. They did, they still did not file their 2016 tax returns okay. yet, or so the 2017. Yeah. So it sounds like there are many things um, that are a challenge. Yeah. We have about one minute. Is there something yeah. you would like to say? Well, I think the thing that is really important is for people to understand is the court case, because of the way the animal cruelty law is very, was extremely narrow, it focused on unsanitary conditions, and that's right. it. It only focused on one individual. Right. Yeah, this so the judge had yeah, I mean, these reports of 10 dogs neglected, that was that's new information. Okay. No one has seen that yet. Yep. It just became public. There are no... Um, there's been no prosecution of that as of yet. And so the I petition know, you're filing will bring forth um, some of these details and hopefully we'll... Well, that's public information now and yeah. it's on the Facebook page that well, um, Beth started. All right, so here's one more Facebook thing and then I think we have to close. Great Home Friends should never be allowed to reopen. Decades of state and town regulations have been violated by Great Home Friends with at least three cease and desist orders. A fine and countless warnings. Great Home Friends not only fail to provide medical care for dogs with severe medical issues, but provide, fail to provide most basic animal care, not for lack of funds. Oh, well. Yeah. <laughs> All Thank right. Thank you for joining us tonight. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks, Stephen. All right, guys. Thank you.